So the first half of 2020 has changed the way we live, work, and think. From the pandemic to social unrest, our cultural coordinates have shifted in tumultuous ways. It is at times like these that museums and artists take the opportunity to foreground the power of art. How art can bring people together and change the way we think. But if we truly believe that art has the power to instigate social change, what change should it initiate now? And how? How can art help us fight police brutality, social injustice, and racism? How can it communicate to white audiences in order to change minds and engage those who are not already part of the discussion? And how can political art avoid drowning into the world of slogans and aesthetics of ideological bandwagonism of today in order to address issues as urgent as racism? Political art has always faced specific challenges related to form and content. While its relevance is undeniable, my concern with some political art stems from the awareness that too overtly on the nose aesthetic tactics might drive audiences away from urgent conversations. An example of this could be Mark Wallinger's 2007 installation State Britain, in which the artist recreated an Iraq protest display set up by peace campaigner Brian Ho outside Parliament. Another could be the Holt Action Group plaque commemorating, say commemorating, Trump's leaked sexual assault monologue from 2016, which employed a similar head-on tactic. I suspect that these pieces succeed in stirring the type of media controversy that quickly shifts emphasis from important content to the trite question, is this art? At a time when images of protests flood social media on a, on a daily basis, how can today's political art convey powerful messages that entice viewers with a real potential for radical change? Inspired by the work of African-American photographer Roy de Carava and, poetry, and the poetry of Langston Hughes, the photographic series Night Coming Tenderly Black by David Bay provides a blueprint for the kind of political art I think our time truly needs. Leaving people entirely out of the picture, Bay makes his political statement through images of landscapes leveraging their psychological power to shape our identities. By passing the cliches of political art, Bay's images do a lot more than simply inform, shame, or protest. They draw the viewer into a state of vulnerability in order to instill empathy. The power of Bay's photographs lies in their tacit acknowledgement that nature is not a given, and that neither is it the opposite of culture. Nature is a concept we have shaped over a millennia of images, texts, compositions, constructions, garments, and performances. The trees, the rocks, the air, and the water simply are. They don't care about us. Our desires, our spirituality, our pasts, and even our futures. Although this might seem counterintuitive, nature is not the forests, the mountains, and the deserts either. Nature is in our heads. It is a concept inescapably defined by our histories, desires, spiritualities, sometimes even by our futures, and certainly by our pasts. Somehow it seems much easier to grapple with the notion that gender, race, and identity are constructs than to acknowledge that nature belongs to the same category, a translation of the material world into words, sentences, concepts that reflexively generate a, same, a seamless illusion of human centrality and dominion. The history of landscape painting in Western art is the quintessential incarnation of this paradigm. We know that John Constable, one of the main protagonists of British Romanticism, intentionally designed his landscape paintings like theatre sets. He repositioned trees and often erased landmarks of the Industrial Revolution, which at the time 
relentlessly eroded the serene beauty of the British rolling hillsides he so much loved. The aesthetic principles underpinning these paintings have substantially shaped British national identity. After all, Constable was renowned for sketching outdoors, a celebrated break from tradition that, in hindsight, looks less revolutionary than it may have initially seemed. True, stepping out, of, stepping out of the studio led Constable to capture the truth of natural lighting. In that sense, like his contemporary, Turner, he was a modern painter. But in essence, his approach to the representation of nature still remains shackled to the pillars of classical painting. It's obsession with perfecting nature and celebrating purity. Since the Renaissance, European artists have begun to paint landscape from the comfort of their studios. They sampled and selected from other artists' works. They moved and rearranged to produce impossibly harmonious backdrops against which the dramas of humanity could be immortalized with the appropriate dignity. Claude Lorraine and Nicolas Poussin set the indelible blueprint for landscape painting in the West. Their classical Baroque influence reverberated through Turner into the works of the Impressionists nearly 200 years later. And even then, it took Monet most of his career to realize that the ghosts of classical painting still followed him whenever he left the studio to paint en plein air. Painfully aware of this con condition, at one point Monet wished to have been born blind and suddenly see the world at once, so to paint it freed of its symbolic meaning and the bias of prior experience. His late water lily paintings are the result of this acute awareness and this desire to see past the cultural layers that predefine our conception of nature. Art history has gone as far as acknowledging that Constable, along with the artists of the Hudson River School, who were also influenced by him and Turner, substantially idealized landscape. But whose perspective did those idealization represent? During the second half of the last century, art historians Kenneth Clark, W.J.T. Mitchell, and post-colonial scholar Edward Said have all linked the, emergent, the emergence of landscape painting to the rise of imperialism and the marginalization of so-called non-Western other. But I believe that more should be done to foreground the idea that landscape painting has relentlessly constructed nature from the perspective of true white privilege. The gaze defining the imagery of Western landscape has all along been very white and very male. European 17th and 18th century paintings were often commissioned by an ever wealthier and powerful class of landowners who increasingly identified with their land. Their desire to have it immortalized in bucolic images to display in the paneled rooms of their estates fueled the rise of the landscape genre. Thereafter, even when painted for the general public, Landscape canvases implicitly reaffirmed the power of the white male gaze through the multiplication and slight variations of a newly canonized theme. This representation in, in its widespread commercial success turned landscape painting into truth, a truth in which human politics, as observed by geographer Yi Fu Tuan, are always implicated. Often, I add, this is true when, like in the case of David Bay, the human is absent from the scene. Paintings of the Romantic landscape primarily functioned as power statements in which brushstroke after brushstroke, the struggle and exploitation of workers became concealed by layers of rhetoric. Even when the artists of the French Realist movement took it upon themselves to expose the hardship of peasant life, their attention turned to white workers. This is where art history still has some important work to do in acknowledging the role white centrism has played in defining the aesthetics of many Western masterpieces. <laughs>
The purpose of such commitment would not be to simply foreground the true cultural and historical matrix of these paintings, in itself a valuable example of good scholarship, but to truly and critically engage with the all-prevailing influence of white centrism, its ramification into white supremacy, and its exclusionary powers along with the white defining identity logics that has all along entailed. At stake is the opportunity to reappraise past histories of representation, not to simply demonize them, but to open up the possibility for a new aesthetic lexicon that might assist us in decolonizing landscape through art. Our consumption of landscape painting has been so far defined by an important paradox. Landscape painting has sedimented in our minds through images of a better past that never was. Drenched in a sense of nostalgia for a world that only what we call the 1% had the chance to ever experience. To the rest, the landscape, the countryside, the gentle rolling hills were a place in which tremendous suffering unspeakable poverty and social injustice played out on a daily basis. Here lies the paradox. Over the past 300 years, art has turned the capitalist privilege of a minority into the cultural truth of a majority. What hangs on the walls of the most important museums in the world, the dreamy images that have become a cultural reference point in our definition of nature, are the ultimate representation of true privilege. Despite having studied the history of landscape and the representation of nature for years, and thus being well aware of what we, how we construct the natural world into a rhetorical anthropocentric kingdom, David Bay's photographic series, Night Coming Tenderly Black, added something essential to the picture. At first glance, Bay's series of black and white photographs presents itself as a history piece. In the words of the artist, the series presents a visual reimagining of the movement of early 19th century fugitive slaves through the Cleveland and Hudson, Ohio landscape as they approached Lake Erie and the final passage to freedom in Canada. I think this painting in specific, in specific by Gainsborough really gives us a good starting point from which to um, assess the aesthetic differences, the composition, the lighting that differentiates the classic archetypal approach to um, Western landscape and what David Bay presents. Bay's images and reimagining reach deep into the history of Western landscape, its aesthetic ambitions, psychological dimension, and the elitist subjectivity that over time has defined our conception of nature and with that race. In our minds, nature is culturally constructed as the true, the given, the baseline, the unchangeable. But Bayes' design, Bayes' series easily shows how we structure nature, thus also pointing at the possibility to deconstruct and reconfigure what we consider a given or something unchangeable. In this series, Bay entrusts photography with the important deconstructing work of undoing the painterly gaze of art historical giants. Each image captures a landmark of the so-called Underground Railroad, a network of safe houses and sheltered locations that fugitive slaves could find on their journey to freedom. The photographs capitalize on a rich range of subtle grays and black tones typical of gelatin silver prints to produce softly contrasted views that invite close inspection. In the place of alluring dawns or golden sunsets, Bay exposes an often eerie and ambiguous American landscape at twilight. His images evade any easy classification in the pre-existing aesthetic categories of the beautiful, the picturesque, and the sublime. They perform a non-affirmative aesthetic. And I say this in reference to Michel Foucault's conception of classical painting, what he calls Quattrocento painting in his work. David Bay stages a decentralizing experience that 
in Foucault's word could be called an event, a transformative moment of realization that reaches deep into the mind of the viewer. Foucault explored this uh, idea across a couple of essays from the late 70s and 80s, like the one titled Thought Emotion, which focuses on the work of Duan Michaels, and Photographic Painting, an essay collaboration with Gilles Deleuze uh, about the work of Gérard Fromanger. In these essays, Foucault becomes specifically concerned with series of images in which multiple photographs or paintings hold the key to something bigger, to an existentialist shift that only art can um, communicate or stage. To en enable this kind of experience, the wall text in David Bay's exhibition is deliberately hidden away from the gallery's entrance. So viewers are left to wander without guidance. Bay knows that in the absence of cultural coordinates, they will search the archives of their minds for what they already know. Hundreds of familiar landscape photographs and paintings. But what's the difference between those and Bay's take on the American landscape? Once found, the text bears the answer. The images in Night Coming Tenderly Black are a meditation on the nation's social and physical landscape and black presence within it. The camera lens coincides with the eye of the fugitive slave. We see no glorious hilltop views and sweeping expanses of land, for these would be a place of high visibility and vulnerability in the world of a fugitive slave. Instead, seemingly impenetrable thickets of trees Placid and yet ominous lake waters and vividly white picket fences stage a first-person encounter with an uncertain, non-affirmative landscape, one that constantly flickers between the promise and the threat, tinged by the uncertainty brought by night's imminent fall. Across the series, series Bay's images of forests more directly spoke to my European upbringing and the cultural connotations that have defined them for me. I grew up with the notion that forests are magical and gorgeous, the setting of fairy tales and medieval epics, places of adventures in which sometimes one can get lost. Dante Alighieri's decision to situate the entry of hell at the edge of the Selva Oscura, the dark forest, and the surrealist artists who followed Sigmund Freud into the woods to decipher the unconscious, speak volumes about forests as mysterious and yet wonderful, wonderful sights. But Bay's images of forests belong to a different world, and that's where their political power comes from. They are ambiguously quiet and unnervingly enigmatic. They are simultaneously yesterday and today, places of temporary shelter for the fugitive slaves dreading to cross open lands by day, and insurmountable barriers and inescapable labyrinths where lives can be lost. The sad truth, so vividly impressed upon the silver surface of Bay's photographs, is not remotely concerned with witches and spells or breadcrumbs concealed by the snow. It is neither mythological nor magical, Night falling tenderly black is drenched with the palpable fear of one's own life. For one's own life, the truth of utter vulnerability and the deepest loneliness on a desperate journey to freedom across a strange land that yesterday is today, only white people have the right to call home. Here lies the photograph's ability to change minds and call for empathy the invitation to stand in someone else's shoes, to see with their eyes through photography and feel with their hearts. Night Coming Tenderly Black shows us how we, people of different colors and races, can inhabit the same landscape while living in thoroughly different worlds. It is by making us acutely aware of this subjective perspective and representing different point of views previously omitted and previously omitted constructions of nature as seen by fugitive slaves 
that bay decolonizes centuries of landscape painting and with it a history of modern civilization. It shows us how pervasive white centrality can be. It is its ability to naturalize itself through art, often through images of nature, that makes it so powerful in defining our thinking and, as a result, in defining our lives. In this way, Bay reminds us of the true power of images, how representations of nature can naturalize themselves in our minds to the point that we can hardly pinpoint the power structures they have emerged from in the first place. It's when those power structures naturalize that the trouble begins, and it's by honestly exposing them again that true hope for change can start to emerge.